Okay, thank you. Thank you again. So, um, you know, in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about high risk and also the uh, treatment of, of myeloma when it's coming back, uh, relapsing, you know, after uh, an initial therapy. And as you've heard from Jenny, we want to make this very interactive. I do have slides, but they're only for the purpose of supporting whatever comes out of this, uh, out of this conversation. And I'll, I'll put some of them for, for uh, background information. So first of all, you know, this is one of the, the most important questions. You know, what, why do we do high risk and what does it mean to have high risk disease? We, we've used the term uh, to describe um, the versions or if you may, the flavors of myeloma that somehow may have some features that make us think that it's going to be uh, more aggressive or more rapid growth or perhaps also more resistant to the treatment. That's what we mean by high risk. I should emphasize, this is very, very important. High risk is not 100% determinant. It just tells us you have to pay more attention. But it doesn't mean like you have high risk and well, you know, there's, there's nothing to do. No, there's a lot of things that can be done. So it's very, very important. High risk is never uh, determinant uh, 100%. Now, there's many things that come into how we might think of someone as having high risk or not. Uh, some of that could be uh, the genetics. That's a very common one. So when we take a sample from the bone marrow, we do the genetic study of those cells and try to see if, if the person has high risk markers. I've mentioned some of those during, during the first part of the morning. Uh, but we look at many other things. We look at, uh, you know, the clinical course of the, of, of the person. We may say someone had a good risk markers, but it turns out that only a year after transplant, we have the disease that is coming back. We would start thinking, this, is, this looks more aggressive, so this would be perhaps more, more high risk and, and so forth. So, um, you know, those are some, some of the things that make us think differently about the, the various forms of myeloma. This is a, a, a paper that it's over 20 years now that we published that looked at the outcomes of the markers. And, and those are the three main ones that I told you, the 4, 14, 14, 16, and minus 17. Um, now, one of the things that I, I, I would share with you, I have patients with high-risk markers, and I can think of five patients right now, easily, who have had not only good outcomes, but I think some of them may actually be cured from their disease. I have two patients from, with 14, 16, who are out, you know, 10 years, MRD negative, doing great. So, truth be told, if I'm meeting with someone the first time, I would much rather say you don't have high risk markers because I know the road can be a little bit easier, but it's not like we're giving up just because they're high risk markers. If anything, you know, you pay more attention. So that's very, very important for, uh, for you to know. Uh, a second point which would be important, and then I'll, I'll make a pause after that, and then maybe we can start with some of the questions on, on the high risk. Um, high risk uh, can occur with the passage of time. So there, there are some things that are core to the myeloma cells. So for instance, if you're 414, you're 1114, every single one of the cells of that myeloma you know, uh, patient will have the 1114 and they will be 1114 forever, 100% of the cells. That never changes. Those are kind of primary foundational changes. But things like chromosome 1 or the lesion 17, they can come up with time. So sometimes we'll test again, and in someone who's facing a next line of treatment, that may be uh, a time where we may, may find high-risk markers. And again, that just makes us think a little bit different about what we're going to do with, with the treatment. What else can be done? Well, there's, there's emerging information from various clinical trials that shows that if you have high-risk markers, but you're able to become MRD negative, that kind of lessens by a lot the effect of those high-risk markers. Um, it, it appears that for patients who have only one high-risk marker and they're able to become MRD negative, the outcomes become about the same as if you didn't have those high-risk markers. Two high-risk markers still creates a little bit of a gap but things have gotten better. So, so this is one more way in which we have to think about how we think about high-risk markers in the clinic. Uh, so A, a lot of this is biology, but there's other factors. Uh, B, we, you know, it changes, but we have some idea of what the markers are, and you know, we will test for that for, from your bone marrow. Um, ideally, we would like to get a, a sample at the time of diagnosis. I know that's not always possible, because sometimes we see patients that you know, our, our colleagues in the community have started on therapy. If you come after three cycles of therapy, there's not going to be enough uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow. And that's, of course, a good thing. 
the only limitation is we cannot test for risk. And you cannot go back and test on the, on the biopsies that were done before. It has to be done with a fresh sample. And three is risk sort of matters and it changes over time, uh, but it's something that, that uh, is not 100% determined. So let me make a pause there and maybe entertain some, some of the questions that you might have. And if you don't, I, I don't know, are we, are we passing microphones or should I repeat the question? Oh, we, we have a microphone here. So if you don't mind, raise hands. I know we have a question here, two questions here at the front, and then uh, uh, raise your hand and we'll make sure you get a, get a microphone. <clears throat> Can you give it a try again? And if not, I'll repeat the question as we get it going. Uh, do I have a question? Testing. I have the P17 deletion that was identified at diagnosis uh, by fish testing. Uh, along the way, I've heard several times from my Loma experts how important it might be to have genetic uh, expression profiling or sequencing done, <clears throat> pardon me, in order to try and stratify the risk. Only when I speak to my oncologist, hematologist, and when I speak to organizations like Healthtree and others, uh, no one can direct me to where I can get uh, genetic expression profiling or sequencing. Sure. So can you comment on that? Sure, thank you. The, the question is very, uh, very important. So as you can see in this curve, 17P deletion, this, this curve was owned by fish. And what it means is you're just lacking one copy of chromosome 17. Back then, our technologies were not that good, so we thought the other copy is fine. It just seems that one copy is, 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 is lost. Let me take a quick step out. This will be very relevant to 17P. As you know, we're all born with two copies of every gene. That's why our genome has uh, you know, 46 chromosomes, but it's 23 pairs, one from mom and one from dad. We, we have since learned that the 17P deletion, as is shown in this graph, is important but mostly when the other gene, the other copy in the other chromosome, it is mutated. Actually more so than, than gene expression. I'll get to your question in a second. So having 17P is, 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 is undesirable. We don't want to see that, but mostly because it tells you, you, you have taken one step. You just need one more step, which is a mutation to become very aggressive form of, of multiple myeloma. Most centers, uh, including most academic centers, are not currently testing for sequencing. For those of you who don't know them, you say, so FISH is a test that we do. You count the number of spots you see under our microscope to see how many copies we have of 17P, which is what we have here. And the question is, should we look at other things like the consequence of this, like the RNA, or should we actually do actually the DNA sequencing as we do for the, for the MRD testing? Um, Unfortunately, most institutions don't do that. We, we have the capacity to do that at Mayo. So if we want to know if someone has a mutation, which is the secondary one, uh, there's a couple of things that are required. Three, well, yeah, three things. One is you need, to, you need to have an institution and a place that can do that. So, so it doesn't get done in the average laboratory. Uh, and you need to have a fresh sample. It cannot be done out of stored paraffin blocks. Uh, many of you might know when you get a bone marrow biopsy, a little chunk of that biopsy is put in a paraffin like inside a candle, if you may. And that can be studied later by pathologists. But you cannot do those genetic studies on those samples. And number three is you need to have sufficient number of cells. So if you have a bone marrow, someone's in a remission, and even like say someone's MRD negative, close to MRD negative, there is no hope for anyone doing genetic testing because there's just not enough cells. So that's the good news and, and the bad news, but if someone has, has uh, an excellent level of response, you cannot, you cannot test for that, and you cannot go back in time to do that. Now going forward, as we're seeing new patients, we're now doing uh, a lot more of the sequencing to see if we can find those abnormalities. I hope that answers it. At diagnosis, I, I, um, my um, HDL was high, and... Um, um, or LDH, sorry, LDH okay. was high, and so it threw me into that high-risk category. Uh, I don't see clinical trials or much information around um, how treatment changes or is impacted when you have a patient with high LDH. Does that really come into play anymore, or what's the impact of that? Um, 
the short answer is yes. It's a little bit like that dashboard for the plane that I was showing. So if you have high LDH and everything else looks normal, I might say I have to keep an eye on that LDH and that patient may have some features that make it high risk, uh, but not necessarily. Now, if you have someone who has a high LDH, but you also have a 17P deletion, or you also have one of these high risk translocations, then I go like, mm, this is gonna look more like, like truly a high risk. So I don't think there's any clinical trials per se that have been developed for high LDH patients. Um, if, if you go into the literature, some, and I know some of you read the papers, uh, you can look at any risk factor, and then the articles usually have something that's HR, which is has a ratio. So it tells you how much worse things are because of that factor. So the higher that number, the, the worse the contribution of that factor. So for LDH, it's not very high. It's about like 1.5. If you have like 17P deletion and mutation, it can be like five, that number. So it, it, it sort of, they all have different weights on how bad they are for, uh, for prognosis. Now, one of the things I would say, and I, I mentioned it briefly before with the answer of the previous question, if someone is high risk, then I'm gonna put extra effort and emphasis to, to try to get that person to become MRD negative. So as an example, if someone completes transplant, I mentioned that we measure MRD and the MRD is positive, I usually phrase it the, same, the, the following way. If you're MRD positive and you have standard risk, I will offer and discuss additional treatment. I believe you should get additional treatment. But if you're high risk and you're MRD positive, I will try to twist your arm to get more treatment. I'll work a lot harder for you saying, yes, I'm, I wanna get more treatment for that reason. And you know, I can do the Jerry Springer too. I can, <laughs> can, can walk around and give the microphone. If you raise the hand, whoever wants the next question, I'll take it to you. Hi, Dr. Fonseca. Hi. Loud. Um, this is a standard risk question. So for patients who have the translocation 1114, there was a, I think, somewhat newer trial, that is it called Canova trial? Sure. That showed that there was not a st statistically significant improvement in PFS with that. But having said that, I know that is sometimes used off-label for myeloma patients. Do you think there's still clinical significance? And would you give that upon relapse to your um, patients who have the T1114? Sure, great question. Um, that clinical trial has made us all get prilosec and heartburn and everything else because we don't think it describes really what's going on with 1114. You're right, the clinical trial is called CANOVA and it was a uh, flip of the coin, so randomized phase three trial of pomalurmanide dexamethasone versus venetoclax dexamethasone. And the very specific question that that trial addresses is the following. Can we show that in patients with advanced myeloma, venetoclax dexamethasone is better than pomalutamide dexamethasone if you have the 1114? It was only patients with 1114. All the markers show that venetoclax was better, except that it, it didn't reach that threshold of what we call statistical significance. So I'm using the analogies, like if I go into the golf course with Tiger Woods, and it turns out that in one of the holes I beat him, you won't believe that I'm better than Tiger Woods. <laughs> It just happens that there was an alligator and it was raining and Tiger Woods got an allergy or something happened. It was a fair competition. I can't, the clinical trial was well designed and it was fair, but we still know Tiger Woods is better. I, I, I think every single myeloma doctor in that setting, we were stunned. I mean, the, there, were no, there were more comments than questions when people stood up to the microphone. People are saying, you know, this, we need to find a way to make this drug available for patients. Uh, it was very surprising that the duration of benefit in that patient population was so short. It was nine months. It doesn't, happen to what, it doesn't matter what happens with the control arm. And also for a lot of these patients, the question is never that. I'm gonna use pomalutamide dexamethasone. A lot of people who are getting venetoclax have already been exposed to pomalutamide. And oftentimes we combine venetoclax with things like daratumumab with great results. At that same meeting, they presented a study with uh, daratumumab plus venetoclax for 1114 patients. At five years, over 70% 70, 70 of patients had not required change in therapy. I've used a lot of venetoclax in patients with 1114. I've often seen MRD negative with 1114 patients who get venetoclax combinations. So we don't know what happened. It's like we don't have a very, very, very good answer with that clinical trial, but I, I think everyone agrees it doesn't represent the true benefit of venetoclax. Do you just want to talk about how 1114 is like the only genetic marker, if people aren't familiar with that? Sure. So the 1114, you see it in that curve. It's, it's part of that green curve. It's, it's one of the translocations. When I use the word translocation, it means an abnormal linkage of two parts of chromosomes that shouldn't be together. 
I use the term, they're like swinger chromosomes. They exchange a little part there. And 11 and 14 exchange a little fragment, and it turns out this is seen in about 15%, uh, so one in six myeloma patients. And it used to be considered a good marker. Now, over time, kind of the progress didn't catch up as much with 1114, so that's why we were so excited about venetoclax. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a primary genetic event, so 100% of the cells always have the, the 1114. If you have an 1114, it's actually very important for the reasons we were talking about, of course, the venetoclax. It's seen in a bunch of other conditions. So patients who have the sister disease amyloidosis, half of them have 1114. Patients who have primary plasma cell leukemia, at least half of them have 1114. IgM myeloma, which is very rare, they, they tend to be enriched for this. So there's a lot of things that, that come forward with this 1114. It's considered a little bit neutral. Um, but for the 1114, I'm thinking it, we have to think of it like different biology. It's like, you know, um, something that is so different from, from the other forms of myeloma that I think in time we'll consider it almost a separate disease rather than your, your garden variety, uh, multiple myeloma. I don't want to get into all the technicalities, but I think it's a myeloma that arises like a little bit earlier than other myelomas. It's a younger form of myeloma. I think that's what we see with 1114. And it turns out uh, one of the signals that this myeloma has is a protein called BCL2. BCL2 is a signal that tells cells, don't die. You stay alive, don't die. We call that anti-apoptosis. And this venetoclax blocks that message. So then the cells, when they get exposed to other things, they die. Uh, I, I have a question regarding uh, 1Q gain. I don't see that on the, on the slide. And sure. it, there's just a, it, there seems to be a lot of confusion, or at least I'm confused about 1Q gain. And it, if it is high risk, and could you explain a little, sure. little of that? Sure, thank you. Mm. That, that, is, that is probably one of the most, uh, one of the hottest topics we have right now is this whole thing with 1Q. So chromosome 1, first of all, it's important to know it's the largest chromosome in, in the human genome. Uh, that's why it was given the number 1. Um, and we have known there's abnormalities of chromosome 1 in a lot of patients. There's an important terminology to, 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 you know, uh, to be described here. There's something called 1Q gain. That means instead of the two copies, you have three copies. And then there's 1Q amplification, which is four copies. Now, here in this graph, what I'm showing you is what happens over time. Blue is uh, gain, and uh, purple is amplification. Okay, and uh, as you can see in the graph, you'll see that, first of all, the graph is not 0 to 100%. You see there's a little bit of, like, of a heel there that goes up. That is classic for secondary genetic events. There's some patients there that have 30, 40, 50, 70% of the cells. If this was translocations, it's zero or 100%, okay? So that's number one. Number two is the more copies you have of chromosome one, it is the more aggressive. So people like me believe that only three copies of chromosome one makes it a little bit more aggressive, but not high enough that I would call that patient high risk. I think you need to have four copies. If you put myeloma experts in a room, we're gonna argue about this for 12 hours, and we're gonna walk out of that room without an argument, without a solution. But I do think four copies or more. In fact, we have looked at our data here at Mayo Clinic. We haven't published that yet. We're going to present this at the ASH meeting where we show that I think four copies is really what matters. Three copies can be seen in somewhere between 25 and 40% of patients who have myeloma. So to me, it's very hard to say that I'm going to have a test that is going to tell 40% of patients that they have high-risk myeloma. It kind of starts losing its meaning. It's like, they go up again. It's like everyone becomes above average. So we have 40% of patients and every, you know, it starts losing its meaning. Now, the other reason this graph is important, you see that on the left side is newly diagnosed cases. On the right side are progression cases. You see that on the right side, you see far more purple than blue. On the left side, you see more blue than purple, if you squint a little bit. But, but that means that patients can start with three copies and they can get a third copy. So when you have four copies, it means it's slightly more advanced. Uh, form of, the, of the, those cells. So uh, again, it will remain confusing because depending on what you read, you're going to find three or four. I will confess that even our Mayo Clinic reports for fish, I couldn't convince my colleagues, it will say if you have three copies, you will call it high risk. So, but I, I tell patients, I know it's in our record, this is a Mayo Clinic thing, but I still think you need to get four copies to be, to be high risk. I hope it didn't make it more confusing. <laughs> Other questions for, for risk? There's one in the back. I'll get this one, Jenny. Okay. <laughs> this one is closer to. Thank you. 
Good morning, doctor. Uh, thanks for being here. We appreciate that. Uh, I've been fighting the disease for about 10 years. Um, I've used pretty much everything FDA approved except for CAR-T, which is forthcoming. Uh, I've had two trials that have failed. Five months ago, I was placed on um, teclistamab, if I'm pronouncing it properly. It only lasted two months for me. And I was put on Talvi three months ago, and now it's, it's, it's ceasing to work for me. Uh, I'm being scheduled for um, a CAR-T, the Janssen, in the uh, end of January. But my concern is the BCMA, because those are BCMA-targeted drugs, and so is CAR-T. What are your thoughts on the CAR-T um, prognosis based on BCMA? And if, if there's anything else you recommend um, that's not a BCMA-targeted? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I have to take your question. So the situation, let me just rephrase it a little bit for those in the audience that may not be familiar. So you, you've gone through most of the lines of therapy, and then you get uh, two bispecifics. In the first case was uh, uh, the, the clistamab with targets BCMA. BCMA is that anchor in the cell. And the second one was talketamab, with, uh, you know, targets a GPRC5D, which is the other, the other marker. Um, and uh, if, if you have received one of the agents that targets BCMA, and then you get exposed to another one that targets BCMA, in general, the responses tend to be lower. You know, we, we, and you probably, I know the way you're phrasing the question, you've seen, you've seen the data behind that. So it has make, made us think about, okay, how do we sequence things in such a way that we maximize the, the benefit for the, uh, for the treatment? Very important to say, it does not mean it won't work. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens to 100 patients on that option is what happens to you as an individual. So, so there are patients who have very deep responses to CAR T cells or bispecifics, depending on how, you, you know, how things go. So in your situation, um, when we look at all the treatments we have, there is no question the one that has the highest level of activity is the, the CELTA cell, which is the one you're gonna get. So uh, that's what I would do. That, that would be my, my, my next option. But let's say that was not available or, or you know, of, if that would, didn't work, unfortunately, what else could you, could you do? So there's two other things that come to mind. Um, one of them is there's other CAR T cells that other, target other things. There's a CAR T cell that targets something like uh, what talketamab is, GPRC5D. And there's another bispecific antibody called uh, sevostimab, and that targets FCRH5. We have had the clinical trial open here. There's no slots right now, but we have had the, the clinical trial open. So it's a third target for the, for the bispecifics. And sometimes you get very pleasant. I mean, I have patients, we, we have had a good number of patients. Some patients respond, some patients don't respond, and some patients respond very, very well. So I have had two patients that had, one of them uh, about a year and a half, and the other one is going into two years now with, with um, uh, you know, both of them had achieved MRD negativity. They kind of have some evidence of disease now in the background, but, uh, and, you know, but they, they have done very, very well with, with that too as well. So, so, so those would be other options. Now, it's very complicated. One of the questions one might have, well, couldn't you test for this to know if I'm gonna respond or not? There are so many players in that because it's whether the antibody binds, whether all the cells have the target, whether the T cells are healthy and happy to go and do that fight, et cetera, it's really hard to pinpoint. So it's, the bottom line, it's very hard to predict who's gonna respond and who's not, other than just trying. Thank you. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one more question. <clears throat> uh, about 40 months ago, I had a CAR T, and my three Clonisex have all been MRD negative. But I keep getting M spikes, like every four to six months, I'll have an M spike, and I've never been able to figure out or anybody explain to me, what do you think that is? Okay, so 40 months CAR T, three clonal six negative. Do you know what the genetics are of your myeloma? Trisomy 11, so hyperdiploid, interesting. Okay, and you're, and you're not on a monoclonal antibody. You're not on daratumumab. Just get the IgG and, and the do the pathologists can, I'm sorry to get into much detail, but can they actually measure the M-spike or they just say there's an M-spike? Okay. 
Well, this is, this is unusual, but it's not impossible. Um, just for a background, let me pull it out once, one for, for, the, for the rest of the group. If you have a CAR-T and you have MRD negativity, and it's been 40 months and you have three MRD negativity, that is awfully good. That is, that is very, very good. We, we, we like to see those kind of results. And um, I, I think, you know, we're optimistic that some of this will be very, very long lasting. So I think that, that would be great. Why could there be an M spike in, 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 in the blood when, when you have the bone marrows that are negative? Well, first, the, the bone marrow can not tell you 100% that something is not there. It can tell you that at the level of sensitivity, we didn't find it, but it doesn't mean it couldn't be there. But it would seem like if you have an M spike, that would be unusual. It's possible, like, as I was asking, not your case, but it's possible that someone's getting a monoclonal antibody that comes up as an M spike. So the Artumumab was an example that was mentioned before uh, by Dr. Yada. But even people who were getting antibodies for COVID would get an M spike, a transient M spike, a little one. Or if you get other antibodies for other diseases, so that would be a second one. The third one would be that um, the pathologists are overcalling it. And, and this is what happens. The pathologists are between a rock and a hard place when they read M spikes because we have so much better tools that sometimes they have to cross their eyes. Is there an M spike or not? And if someone has had an M spike in the past, sometimes they say, well, there's a faint abnormality or there's a, maybe a small M spike. I, I don't blame them. This is not a criticism of them, but it's very hard for them sometimes to tell that. If you have had it here, have you had the mass spec, the Malditov? Malditov, does that ring a bell? That was negative. Okay, so this is not any criticism of pathologists, but always trust the Malditov over the M spike because that's probably the, what's happening. That's the third possibility. The fourth one would be that there's myeloma cells in other parts that are not in the bone marrow, like in the lymph nodes, and um, that's why I was asking you about the genetics. So that was a long answer, but uh, uh, you know, this uh, I, I, I think it's probably the third one. So that would be good. See, this is a great example of how the mass spec can help. So, okay, no, go ahead. We have time. Sure. Or is there a value associated with My, mass spec? This is the most sophisticated audience ever. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great question because we're we're asking precisely that question right now. There were no computer algorithms to be able to quantify. That's why. You know, uh, we, we have read it as positive or negative. Starting in January of 2024, we're going to have the ability to quantify. So I have heard that our practice in Rochester had decided to do away with SPEP, and then you start doing Malditoff, and I think we'll do the same thing here as well, too. So, but yeah, it was, there's a lot of technicalities for how it was harder to measure, but now we can measure. So it will be quantitative going forward. So you, should we move to a relapse refractory, Jenny, is that, or are we done with time? How are but Well, go, so why don't we ahead. take more, maybe just yeah, go ahead. a question, to one or two more, and then we can answer questions at the end as well, too, for relapse and refractory. Other questions from the audience? I'll, I'll take that one. Can you just speak a little bit on CAR-T exhaustion? Uh, after you go through a CAR-T, can you regenerate? So like say two years, you relapse again, and you want to do another CAR-T. Uh, can those cells regenerate so your T cells are not exhausted? Not the exception. That's another great question. So T cells have to be healthy to do their job, right? So there's two ways in which we use T cells. I'll bring in the bispecifics here. You take T cells out of the body. You train them, you send them to the facility, and they come back as scar T cells, so they attack. And when they come back, they're supposed to expand, so they go into the body and they can start growing. They flourish. In fact, sometimes they can grow so much that they can be seen in the blood counts, in the peripheral blood count. People are saying, you know, the, the pathologists are all around because as soon as you see a lymphocyte count that goes way up, that's good. That means they're working. But over time, they, they could, a few things could happen. They don't finish the job, and they start kind of becoming lazy, and that's the exhaustion. And then the myeloma cells have, um, you know, an advantage over that. One of the goals or one of the hopes for T cells is you do it once and you're done. And then, but I think it's not impossible to think of a future where maybe we split the product and you get one dose now and you get another dose in three months so that you can um, do that. The same is true with bispecifics. Bispecifics, for those of you who don't know, are like liquid CAR Ts. So you just inject it into the vein and it brings together the T cell and the target cell, in this case, the myeloma cell. 
but those require to the T cells to be healthy. So if the T cells are called to action, but they have no, you know, no stamina, they're not going to do the job. So there's a lot of things that people are looking at to how to improve that. There's medicines that can help the T cells. There's even people who are trying to see if we can regenerate T cells or maybe we can collect T cells on the line. So the versions we're seeing today of CAR T cells will clearly not be the best there is. I'm sure there's going to be future versions of, of even better T cells. One more question. Sure. Um, so we had a question that, uh, that someone asked, like, how fast is my immune system recovering post a CAR T? So we went into our health tree data and looked at lymphocyte counts before and after. And um, for Beckman, it seemed about one month. But what we saw was some patients had a normal range lymphocyte, and they went back to that normal range. And some patients started with a really low lymphocyte count, and then they went back to that same low lymphocyte count. So when you talk about, like, will this work for a patient, do you look at that at all, lymphocyte counts, like before or after? I'm just curious. Well, we do, and there's some people that are trying to study that, what we call the B-cell repertoire, to see how many B-cells you have and what impact it might have. Uh, but I would say, we still are in the learning phase of, of all of this on how that comes into play. I'll give you, I'll give you a, it's a very interesting observation. So the CAR T cells that target BCMA, so the Karvitki and the, the you know, Abecma, the either cell, BCMA um, is expressed in both plasma cells of myeloma, but also normal plasma cells and even some late B cells. One of the things that has been found is if you get a CAR T and a month out from CAR T, let's say you have kappa myeloma, your kappa is undetectable, but your lambda is also undetectable, that is great. Because that means that the CAR T cells are working very well. And the reason I say lambda is because in this case, lambda would come from normal plasma cells that indirectly tells you that the CAR T cell is doing a great job. So we're still learning all of that. And I think there's, there's a good possibility lymphocytes count will matter and then lymphocyte you know, recovery and also health of lymphocytes. Some of the first studies of CAR T cells in myeloma, people were like, ah, oh, it's a little bit disappointing. It's not as durable as we would hope it would be, or it seems that it's better in lymphoma and leukemia. But um, it turns out in myeloma, those CAR T cells were being collected after someone had 10 lines of therapy. They had a transplant, and they have 15 different treatments. So, you know, those T cells come with a crutch and all, you know, full of uh, Band-Aids, and that's what they're, you know, called to do. So the future might be that earlier T cells are going to be a lot healthier. Okay, fantastic information, amazing questions.